Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello, welcome to Varm Vlog, and today we're going to talk about um, all kinds of economic questions. Uh, I have COVID, and it hasn't really hit me very hard yet, but as you can see, I probably don't look super great. Um, I am running a fever, and I am on quarantine, and so uh, once I get done with my work, since I am now sentenced to work from home for a couple weeks, um, I don't really have a lot to do. Um so you may benefit from that this month, even though I'm not. Um, I was asked today to, uh, uh, in very short notice ago, I'm back on a TIR to discuss a very, from what I can tell, a very simple form of MMT. Um, and I watched some videos that made the same claims you always hear MMTers make. And claims that are, are actually, I wouldn't even say a lot of them are false. I just think they're misleading in the grand scheme of things um because all of them assume uh in their presentation in a way that say reading actual mmt economic texts actually really don't um that economies are national economies that almost all forms of money are um created uh, exogenously or autonomously by the state um, and through state state lending uh, and taxation to compel resource expansion and compel labor. And they present this as a good thing, you know. Um, they will often use... Uh, this, you know, truths actually that, for example, that the national debt is largely what the government owes itself in currency creation due to the fact that de jure, the Federal Reserve Bank is a private bank and de facto, it's basically an extension, uh, a non-democratic extension of the government. I'm in day one of COVID for those who are asking. Thank you. Now, what I point out to people is that even within uh, post-Keynesian economics, the assertion that all money creation happens uh, autonomously by the state is um, contested. And that the definition of monetary sovereignty actually implies um, that most states do not have the capacity to autonomously generate money. Now, this really matters because it's the difference between what sometimes I would like to call the imperial implications of modern monetary theory uh, versus states that have to peg their currency to the dollar. And by that, meaning they have to use their currency to buy external resources on the international market. Uh, by buying dollars first and then buying um, uh, the commodities. And thus, the dollar serves as reserve. The idea that I used to hear now, I, I, when you actually dig into MMT theorists, that there are more, far more complicated theories than this. But I used to get presented this very seriously, that the reason why states did this, why, like, say, Venezuela had hyperinflation or whatever, was purely an ideological choice where they could have done something else to peg their dollar another way, 
you know, their currency in other ways. So even uh, away from the dollar. Then you will get the list of currencies that have currency sovereignty. Um, those being the Australia, the UK, Canada to some degree, the United States, Japan, um, and and usually that's about it, actually. Um, you see, at most you'll get nine countries. Generally, you get six or seven. Almost all but Japan are part of the Anglosphere, um, part of the traditional British Empire. And when the shift from the British Empire to the American uh, capitalist hegemony happened, stayed within the privileged zone. Now, you can also say that the Eurozone as a whole has monetary sovereignty, but the contradiction of that within member states creates a tension. All right. And you could also say that China could have monetary sovereignty, but chooses not to because it does not want to free float its currency, which is a, which I've always thought was a particularly weird way to use sovereignty. Right. Because. Why would a sovereign nation not want to control its, its currency with a dual currency form, meaning that, you know, the money trades were one thing on the open market, but is set internally by a central bank and is not free float. Now. Uh, many post-Keynesians will agree with um, modern monetary theorists. Oh, on on almost all the essentials of their neo-chartalism. Um, uh, but will point out that. Um, money is created from within the economy uh through government spending or bank lending rather than from outside by gold so again this is a different kind of autonomous thing so this is endogenous theories of money so and money is created by bank lending or by um government spending government deficit spending or both all right now this is slightly different than the autonomous theory of money is just like the government sets it up because banks can create additional money through this not related to uh their own uh, to the central banks loaning to them and thus through monetary and and, and uh fiscal policy. Okay. So and then there's another there's the third autonomous theory of money which is basically uh usually defined by metalism, but it's, it's the idea that um, money develops autonomously through commodity value. Something like what Marx sees as what's happening between, uh, between different groups in barter and state. Now, anthropological research backs up some of the chartalist points, and this is where I agree with them. And, and, and um, that within societies, and I've said this on another video, Within societies, there and that, see this is I, I I get this and this has the order of operations backwards. Their economy is heavily dependent on oil exports because that is the basis of their resource value, which even in MMT is the basis of your actual economy. Thus, they have no choice but to peg their currency. But that's true for all non-imperial states. Unless you can force people to take your currency, you have to have a mediating factor, which is historically why the periods of fiat money versus commodity money are different. And this is something that Colin Drama has done research in, but in general, people avoid. The currency of the realm is set by the government because it's what it will accept for taxes. But the government's interest is not always in compelling labor within its own borders. Often, a government's interest is in the interest of its national bourgeoisie to get materials of which it is not in direct control and cannot directly expropriate. To do that, it must trade with other nations. And to trade with other nations, it must have something that they need, or at least can translate to something that they need, and is stable. Government promises 
gener- and promises of future taxation generally are not considered stable, historically speaking, until the development of modern militaries. And there's a reason why you don't see a, sing- a single person even emerging out of the central bank or the stability of a central bank really being the case in the United States until the development of its military prowess. The first people who start signaling from the Fed of something like what we mean by MMT and that the gold standard was somewhat unnecessary did so in the 1940s. That should tell you something. All right. That endogenous theories of money that are heavily dependent on money created within economy, and if you assume that economy is national and thus government spending and taxation policies are what set the tone of the economy, both through credit and debt to the government itself, it also implies that all materials needed to run its economy was within its own borders or can be compelled to be bought in its own currency. Thus, that is the reason And now you're beginning to see it is the remnants of the British Empire and its modern American replacement in the capitalist world that have true currency sovereignty because they either have privilege placed within the circuit of trade in the empire or they have the guns to enforce it. It really is that simple. And when you do not have a hegemon like that, other things stand in for uh for um fiat currency usually it is metal because metal is standardizable and deflationary which is something you would want as trade between people who don't trust each other where credit and debt relations are just as simply to be resolved by war now i say this because this actually comports with 80 to 90 percent of the mmt picture of the history of money I am granting most of their arguments. What I am saying that is different is that you either need some way of getting around national sovereignty, like some kind of transnational currency or some kind of super polity, for MMT to be truly useful in a way that would be beneficial to all in the world. Or, and, and, and then we'll get to the second part of my critique of MMT, which has nothing to do with the facts they describe. I agree with 80% of them. Where I disagree with them is this idea that all money was always constitutionally set. I do not think that that's actually always been true because during periods of, particularly during the end of, of, um, uh, during the early modern period, competition between proto-capitalist nation states and late medieval empires was high enough that trust in individual currencies had to be enforced by strict metal standards, which means enforcement of the currency standard was pretty, was pretty big in the minds of these people. It even shows up in an Aquinas. Um, There are people in critical MMT uh, who will, who point this and say that, you know, Aquinas and then the Franciscans and trying to define poverty uh, accidentally create the idea, the idea, the ideological conditions for metallism. But I just, I, I don't really see the evidence for that being the, what caused the creation. What I see the evidence for is, is the fact that increasingly economies of, of scale needed resources from other economies in which case they had to trade without, without this, without debt, and uh, without debt and credit relations, because they are not subject to one polity's law. These conditions actually do resemble the barter conditions described in classical political economy and in Marx, but the in but. Um, anthropologists and and uh, historians of money such as michael hudson um uh, who is you know tangentially related to mmt um have pointed out that in you know in general the earliest forms of what we would consider currency don't arise from barter they arise from from uh sovereign obligation to compare labor which is basically debt and credit um, and that these debts are periodically wiped out 
um, because otherwise the the social forms become unstable and it starts to breach the entirety of the social fabric. All right, so debt accumulates too heavily over time and without a jubilee, um, which was practiced in ancient Mesopotamia, practiced in theory in ancient Israel. And I say in theory because we actually don't have evidence that the biblical laws were ever actually practiced. They were more like an idea an ideological foil in the Bible. Hudson takes them at face value, but I don't think the uh, the actual historical evidence is not there too. Um, uh, so, whew, sorry guys, it's easy for me to lose my train of thought right now. Um, you have the competition between states creating something like commodity money, which, which is... Again, I would say it is an endogenous form of money, um, but it's an endogenous form of money between states. It's not autonomously valuable. Like gold, in fact, gold's value as money, even in Marx uh, and in classical economy, is not because gold is inherently valuable. It's actually because in gold's commodity usage is minimal, but it's rare. So it makes a good form of money as opposed to other forms of commodity money used priorly in like ancient Rome, for example, like salt, where you're literally going to eat your money. Um, this, you can see how this all goes though, right? Because these two different kinds of, of currency, both representing and fetishizing relations of production and power, um, develop concurrently, but they're really kind of two separate things. And only in states that really try to control things internally, like the USSR, which had a triple ruble system. All right. Does the distinction really become obvious? Like some, uh, you know, are the quote dual currency system in China where like controlling money by the state and not free floating it is considered, is considered part of its own accumulation policy, its own stability policy. So they forego currency sovereignty by having more control over the currency. Whatever. The, the words are weird. But um what matters in all this is what currency trades for, right? Like the currency in and of itself doesn't have a lot of meaning. So when you hear about debts and credits demarcated in currency, what matters is not the currency or the trillions or billions that they're trading for, but the actual resources of which they can acquire or not. And that's what matters to states too. And the reason why states use currency is that it actually hides a power relationship. They are compelling you to work literally at gunpoint through taxation. There is also a reason why the highest points of this kind of fiat money that you find in the past are in periods of empire. All right. American colonial, uh, colonial America in, in its early constitutional forms of money is the prime form that people like Kristen Dawson will use, Christine Dawson, professor of law, will use as their indicators of the creation uh, of money. Colin Drum goes in and critiques this, says it's better than a lot of monetary history, and points out the problem with it. But but the reason, part of the reason is, is Britain is actually extracting wealth value and taking it in and then pumping it back out. The United States actually operates a little differently. All right. The other thing that you see um, in all this is that it all assumes, even though what I just said, currency is a power relationship, even under MMT, it is the ability to compel and create, and it has a positive force. Credit creates things, right? You, do, you know, the government compelling labor through being able to pay people by spending creates things because people then take natural wealth and transfer it through labor into something useful. I mean, literally, you know, that's in all forms of economics. All right. Um, the In early classical economics, the government's not seen as a prime actor in this, but but it really kind of always was. Um, it also creates the ability by stabilizing trade. The cost of money is the cost of market creation. All right. And that is not free. This is actually something where I agree with Colin Drum over some descriptors of Marx. Like uh, uh, there are people like Fred Mosley who is saying in Marx's theory, there's a fundamental that money has no price. Well, that's not true. The price of money is the price of creating the markets. So there is a price involved, like not even in the value of money. 
um, which takes a little bit, a bit to wrap your head around, but we have to create and stabilize the market. Someone's got to be there to do exchange and to standardize things. That requires cost. The cost is in compelled labor. But you should see here that there's an implicit class relation in all of this. And this is where I really jump off the MMT train. Because MMTers make it sound like there are natural incentives within a, a monetary system for classes to get along for the sake of a national polity. It is implicitly, implicitly nationalistic. And it implies that someone has the force to compel labor, but also stand outside of it. Which is why you don't see strong monetary societies in societies like immediate, like you don't have the equivalent of even proto-money in immediate resource consumption hunter-gatherers. It just doesn't exist. Why? Because there's no class relation there to establish the need to compel labor. All labor there is compelled by natural use values. And it's one of the few times you'll hear me use the phrase natural because it really is. I need food as a being. I'm going to go out and get food. I need shelter because I'm a weird ape that doesn't produce enough fur for the kind of... Uh, for the kind of environments I live in. I got to get that somehow too. I'm going to do the labor to get that and then maybe have a little bit of surplus on the side to take care of the sick and elderly or whatever, although not always if I'm in a highly resource scarce environment, and I, then I'm just going to let those people die. But in general, I'm going to do that and that's going to be the extent of my labor. No one has to compel me to do that. That is going to be what I do naturally because if I don't, I will starve or the people I care about will starve. All right. That is an unalienated, unmediated economy. We don't have to go to this whole, you know, uh, Rousseau Island or enclosed plantation in the Middle Ages to see this. But that's basically the only time you do see an unmediated economy. And most times, the moment you have the generation of surplus, you have to allocate it somehow. That And you have to protect it somehow. And the, cre and the need to protect it creates the need for a military. And the need for military creates the need to, for, to support that military. Are the police, are just thugs, whatever you want to think about this as. All right? So you go into the deep anthropology of mankind and you can see what would compel both the creation of classes and the creation of a mediating factor, what Marx has called the commodity fetishism. No, we don't think the commodity fetish inherently has value. No, we don't think the nominal uh, debt is real. You know, like, come on, no, nobody, nobody's serious. I don't even think most neoliberals really believe that. They say that, but they don't really believe that. The nominal debt is nominal. And, and money creation and fiat currency is based off the size of the nominal debt. If you shrink the size of the nominal debt, and, if, and this again, I'm totally in, in agreement with MMT on this. Um, if you shrink the size of the national debt in a modern economy, you will be shrinking the money supply and you will be putting things in a deflationary cycle. You may also be getting rid of paper assets that have no actual valorizability, which means they don't have any real value. If you cannot valorize something in the economy, it is it is fictitious capital. Think about the housing crisis. That is unviralizable capital. It's based on debts that could never be you know could never be fully collateralized and thus valorized. And the only way we could get out of that was creating valorizable capital through QE. But that also indicates that it's not real. And even in our current economy, if people were trying to, to valorize all assets at once, you would realize that those assets were not really in, there were no resources, that there were not enough resources in the economy to back up all those assets, and the economy would crash immediately. But that'll never happen. It just won't. There's no reason in a modern economy for us to all val try to valorize everything all at once. So these are things in which I agree with MMT. Where I disagree with them is they treat the state as a neutral body. 
But as I've already said, the theory of MMT actually implies that it is not neutral. It implies the existence of classes and the existence of somebody to compel the labor of somebody else. That is not neutral. That is not democratic. You can make it more democratic than it, than the autocratic by having more and more public receptors to it. But there is no way in which if everybody understood what was going on, they would all agree to it. Furthermore, and this is where I also disagree with modern MMTers, modern MMTers will say stuff like the reason why there is inflation right now is because government is accepting prices from corporations who are trying to recorp profits dishonestly because of the disconnect between, you know, currency and value, uh, current liquidity of currency and value. And they're trying to recoup profits by raising prices. The government doesn't since the government doesn't negotiate those prices down in its in its buying capacity, it's basically accepting inflation as a form of policy. That n not all MMTers believe that, but that is what I've been explaining that Warren Mosler believes. And actually, Warren Mosler and Stephanie Kelton disagree with that. Kelton actually thinks that the international economy makes that picture way too simplistic, and I agree with her. All right, but. Because I don't think the U.S. government has enough purchasing power, for example, to, to, to truly undo the Chinese economy or the Eurozone if they were ever acting currently together. Nor do I think that the Chinese economy or the Eurozone by themselves could set prices for, um, for the U.S. economy either. These are all things you have to deal with, all right? Now, you will notice that this immediately becomes clear that the one factor of the economy everyone's talking about, currency, all right? And I use currency advisedly, okay? Because you can have non-currency money. Um, like if we had standardized trade in something that wasn't a currency, it would effectively become a currency. But if, it, like, you could have, say, black market money in the sense that in certain markets you know, you, where you're trying to avoid federal oversight or compelled things like, I don't know, cryptocurrency, right? Um, you might want, uh, you might be using, this thing might have all the functions of money, um, which maybe we should remind you what the three functions of money are. And this is that Marx agrees with classical economy. And the economist is this, what are the three functions of money? A store of value, a unit of account, and a medium exchange. Neo chartalism uh, uh, addressed a unit of account to a unit of account towards paying taxes. <laughs> so a unit of account to the government. That's 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 the change made from classical economy to chartalist and neo chartalist economy. All right. So you change one of those definitions. But if you, for example, want something as a medium of exchange that acts as a unit of account and works as a store of value um, in a para-government um, unregulated gray market or black market even, you're not going to want government currency because it's traceable and this and the other. So you might have other forms of money. Um, but often the true you know, the true currency is actually still what the unit of account really is in. So with Bitcoin, for example, we really care that Bitcoin's monitored in dollars. All right. Which is why I've always said it's not truly money. It's some kind of other thing. Um, but if you had a, if you have a large enough gray market sector um, where you don't account for um where you don't account for exchanges in whatever the recognized governmental currency is in your polity, you could have a money that um, is out, you know, that is not a unit of account for paying taxes. But it wouldn't, I, I don't know that I would call it currency and just on a technical level. Have these three functions of account that says all at once um, pre capitalism. According to Marx, they develop slowly through the development of commodity exchanges and need for standardization. So, yes, none of them by themselves are demarcations of capitalism and have existed 
altogether before capitalism. What makes capitalism unique, though, is money starts to be more and more disconnected from its use value. It's totally in the realm of abstract value, and that's how you know you're in a capitalist development scheme. Now, there, are, I tend to take the Brenner Woods four, you know, four part definition of of capitalism. You have free labor, you have reinvestment, uh, you have the ability to lend, and free labor is paid in wages. Um, so, yeah. But money has existed since ancient Mesopotamia. In fact, our first, our, our, our first proofs of money ha come from uh, our first proofs of writing, all right? In fact, if you look at the development of writing, the first accounts are in money and the second accounts are religious. So if those of us who are good old Marxists would say, oh, the two forms of fetishism are the things that they emerge first. Which is why I think formal language developed so we could lie. Because body language is much harder to lie with. But that is a non-Marxist, non-economic argument that I will go into another day. So why am I going through this? Because when, I, when I'm asked to talk to MMTers, I'm often asked to rehash the, well, does the government owe itself? Of course it doesn't. It's a, the commodity fetish is a fetish. Um, I think actually, I, I, I said, so this is actually a fair question, Zach. Um, I think there's several things driving inflation. One thing I think is driving inflation is, is that returns on real commodities is super low. Um, so that there's people looking for ways to invest and, um, they're investing in the faith of eternal QE is becoming less and less obvious so they're investing in things that can extract rents but i actually think that um i also think that that there is what we call cost push inflation all over the system right and cost push inflation is caused by supply chain breakdowns um uh labor shortages um so so you have cost push in two areas both variable and constant capital cost pushes there right like so constant pre constant capital stuff is stuff whose whose relative value is based on use value and is not going to change months over time, um, at, at least not long term. And labor will continue to go up, so that, that's variable or go down, depending on a bunch of things. Um, uh, so, but you know, the, one of the things about spiraling costs in regards to labor is variable capital becomes more expensive in terms of currency during periods of inflation and less expensive in terms of currency during periods of deflation. So it tends to compound already existing factors. It doesn't it usually doesn't cause those factors. So for example, the fact that we have a little bit of stimulus that barely even puts a dip in GDP is not what's causing inflation. All right. Um, what's cause if there's things causing inflation, it is, it is the uh, demand pool inflation of low profitability, looking for other ways to, to generate, um, investment profits when there's very little real things to invest in, and at least in the U.S., um, and then cost push of supply chain and labor breakdowns. All right, I think Richard Wolf is describing probably the, the the driving force, but all these people who are saying this is going to be temporary, like the Democrats did a year ago, are just wrong because eventually the the, the cost push inflation starts turning into demand pool inflation, and they feed back on each other. Yeah, energy costs are also uh, cost push. Um, and changing energy demands are also cost push, right? So we have all these things to deal with, all right? And what I get really frustrated with when I hear, like, like people think I'm on this war with MMT, and there are times where I get on a war path about it. But, like, I'm really not. Because if you look at what I say and what they say, we agree on way more than any neoclassical economist does and i actually think that that the chartalist anthropo the, the people who are chartalist empathetic in anthropology 
are actually pretty correct about the origins of endogenous money um, or endogenous to a, a, a polity. I'm going to use polity and not like government because we're even before that. Endogenous to a polity or a polis. Um, they're right about that. That credit and debt and relations of power and the ability to compel labor without just, you know, shooting people because people get pretty, are not shooting in the ancient past, stabbing people, let's be real. Um, uh, tends to piss people off if you do it directly, but you can hide that relation. That is what Marx was describing in the commodity fetish, though. Um, is it right to, this is a good question. Is it right to say that cost push inflation is dependent on the health of the economy in terms of profit margins and debt overall? Um, no, because there can be ex there can be external shocks, and to call them external is a little bit misleading. <laughs> like to call effects of climate change and global health things uh, uh, external to capital is actually kind of a bullshit claim. But but as far as like we're concerned, and the way we're going to talk right here, there can be external shocks, shocks that have to do with immediate or obvious economic transactions um, that can also cause cost push inflation. Um, the plague, for example, can do it, historically speaking. Now, that's in a pre-capitalist economy. An oil shock can do it. Uh, that can be political or it can be material. If I'm a capitalist and everyone else raises their price, I must also raise my price to meet them. If I, yes, you have to. Yes. Inflation. Inflation. Uh, Inflation, people will say inflation's bad for the rich and good for the poor. It's actually bad for debtors and, I mean, it's actually good for debtors and bad for creditors. But the problem with that is, like, even in modern economies, the distinction between debtor and creditor gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the truly poor get fucked in inflationary moments because they don't have the access to non usurious levels of, of loans anyway. Right. So this is why this whole like, oh, well, the poor don't get hurt by inflation. Like when when libertarians laugh at that, they're actually right to laugh at that. It's it's the middle, the quote, middle class or people with the ability to get to get debt um, who are not hurt by low levels of inflation. Um, but when I say low levels, I probably mean lower than most MMTers. A lot of MMTers have argued that up to 10 percent inflation is acceptable. Um, I tend to think the normal inflation rate of three to five percent, no one gives a shit about. Um, although it does, one of the things I will point out though that the three to five percent does is it hides the fact that the three to five percent inflation rate does hide the fact that wages are stagnant or declining. Yeah. So here's the other thing that you have to do with an MMT. MMTers will tell you, and accurately, again, I'm a Marxist, I actually believe that the productive capacity of society is its real economy, not whatever fucking nominal number you're going to throw up there. Um, that the resources, the uh, MMTers will say, not how do you pay for this, but how do you resource this, right? The resource productive capacity in the economy is a real limit of the economy. I think that's true, but that that can make it sound over simple because right now we this is where this is another of my pushbacks on the seeming autarky implied in some versions of mmt as presented overly simply um it implies that governments don't have to pay for things outside of their polity really um uh or that they can do so in their own demar in their own in their own money in cups of taxes and that their national bourgeoisie can too um but we live in a con economy where no singular polity actually can have all the resources that it needs there's no way for a for a modern economy to totally autonomously resource itself and that's been true all the 20th century it was actually one of the driving factors of the economic problems in the ussr when the you know when the world revolution didn't happen and it died in germany particularly in the in the uh in the german um soviets which collapsed and were crushed um so but uh but there is the, there is a sense in which like the the threats of capital flight in the imperial core is just ludicrous like no it's not going to happen 
Uh, that's not going to happen in China either, because the the amount of resources you get from operating those economies would, would, would means putting you're willing to put up with a lot of you know costs to work in those economies, um, and people do, not just in the U.S. but also in China and the eurozone. And so MNTs are often right about that. But what, what I think they miss is like this means that the ability of a singular polity to set purchasing is really kind of based on its ability to make people take its currency. Um, or you have to trade in something else. Now, in the, in the 20th century, I think this, the, I think there is a big, you know, when we talk about the petrodollar, that's like, that's like the hidden proxy commodity. I don't think that's true anymore. I don't think the petrodollar is what's driving everything, um, but that's when I—that's what I mean when I say like there's a reason why MMTers probably don't ever really want to cut the military. Um, the other thing I will say is even some of the more you know simple simplistic views of MMT will admit, for example, one of the reasons why you might want to tax the rich is to is to limit their. Um, their actual wealth disparity and their thus influence in society and their ability to compel labor, uh, you know, separately from government. Um, uh, and I agree with that, um, actually, as probably right, one of the real reasons that governments want to tax things is basically the government's arbitrate between the bourgeoisie. Um, but I also think that that indicates that you're never going to get like all the policies that most MMTers would think would be um would be beneficial for everybody um because there's no incentive um for people in class conflict to allow it like there's no reason why the bourgeoisie would want full employment ever because even more than unionization full employment would mean that people could full employment makes variable capital almost fixed capital and really hit profit margins Uh, would you say a Jet Jubilee is doing a modern comedy? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> like, like, like if I want, like, I, I don't want to save capitalism, right? Like, this is not my goal. But if I wanted to save capitalism right now, I might actually push for a Debt Jubilee seriously. Or at least a significant debt reduction. Particularly when we know that we're about to have um, um, a deflationary period due to government policy. Yep, full employment would make laborers price setters, or at least the government price setters. And if the government was really responsive to, to the majority of the population, then it would make laborers price setters, setters through the government policy. And I don't even see it's in the government interest to do that. Like that to me is the most like it's the most it's it's why I can't totally hate on MMTers because like part of their vision is just as radical as mine, but it's also like the part where I'm like, yeah, but that's never going to happen. Like we could literally, I think I could literally overthrow most world governments before I could ask people to just give me that. And I can't overthrow world governments. I can't do crap. I have COVID. I'm stuck in my room. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I'm going to be on T. Uh, this is revolution tonight discussing with an MMT -er who I think wants to argue with us. Um, uh, everybody assumes I don't know MMT, which is wild. Uh, you know, I, I've I've read all these policy papers, and they all assume I'm not sympathetic to it. And like, I'm, if anything, what a lot of people would say is I'm a post MMT Marxist hybrid person because I do actually think that the MMTers notion of early mo of what caused early money is actually correct anthropologically. I just also think the Marxist description of what happened with money actually does apply between states. All right. And that's what I got. Uh, I went tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and I hope I don't fall out during it because I'm tired and I lose my voice periodically. And what am I fuck? What am I doing right now? I'm talking because I'm bored. Ugh, COVID sucks, guys. And yeah, before you guys ask, I wore a mask. I'm vaccine boosted. I only go into work two days a week anyway. And then today was the day I would normally go into work. And actually, I woke up and I had some antigen tests laying around. Because uh, a person I used to see and really care about has an even weaker immune system than I do. So I was very careful. And I woke up and I had cotton mouth and I felt like shit. So I went and took the antigen test. And lo and behold, despite 
and uh, wearing an N95 mask in public, despite I think I've I've gone and had coffee with someone outside where I took the mask off in public once, and it was outside. Um, despite all that, despite the fact they don't have kids, despite the fact that in the office we've been wearing masks, still got it. It seems it seems like the va vaccine boost it is doing what it's supposed to because. All I really have is a fever and a little bit of delirium and a sore throat. But we're on day one, I think. So we'll see. Um, I'm supposed to do an interview tomorrow. So if I'm not dead, um, I will. I shouldn't make those kinds of jokes. But what are you going to do? Gallows humor is what it is. Yes, it is. Foreign dead is now. Yes, it, 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 it right. That's the reason why you're probably not going to see a dead jubilee, actually, is because it would also fuck with international policy. Um. But anyway, so I'm going to try to discuss this. Um, for those of you who don't know, I also have Sam Kangerloo and Max Seho of Superstructure Podcast coming on to talk about this stuff. And um, what I do, if you guys think I'm ever unfair to MMTers, you know, feel free to push back because I, I will say, if as far as like understanding contemporary capitalism, the debate between, I think the debate between MMTers, post Keynesians, and Marxists is going to be how we figure a lot of this stuff out. Um, but there are times where, I, where the, my, my, my feelings about whether or not MMTers are trying, are, are like, our are, are frenemies, our friends varies on the day. I'll admit that. All right. Oh, guys. Uh, I hope you learn a lot about economics. Share, share these if you like and subscribe. I got, I got to thank a patron. Um, before now, I have a new uh, Kanye Kahanan. That's a ten dollar patron, um, and that is uh, uh, from Max Smith. Um, and I think I have another one. Um, we'll find out. I'm not being told about my other one, but I think there is another one. Um, uh, I also wanted to thank you guys. I've hit, uh, in the last month, I have hit um, 200 and something patrons. Um, uh, and uh, I would like to thank you. I know times are going to be hard, so, you know, contribute what you like. Um, it's more important to me that you share this information. Um, but uh, I, I don't monetize my YouTube. I literally only take money from patrons um, right now because... It makes me more honest. Um, and uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm also not going to care at my day job because I don't want to have to chase the clout and talk about whatever stupid shit people are talking about on the internet or any of to make money. Uh, yeah. And I'm not saying that MMT is totally wrong. I, in fact, even in that video, I said something more complicated than that. What I said though, I, I, I will say this, and this hasn't come up in our discussions. I do believe in labor theory of value and that is incompatible with elements of MMT. And that has to do with how we explain downturns, but that's a much more complicated thing because that's not about currency. That's about the actual reason for like price depreciation and the reason why currency and, and real value would depart and the reason why there's different purchasing power in different parts of the world and all that. To me, that has to do with LBT and with inter and with international law separately. There are two complicated factors. I think anybody who tells you there's one factor for anything in economics, which is the theme of this video, they're like kind of lying to you. Like they're not totally lying to you. They might be telling you one factor is truth, but almost everything we do is overdetermined in the sense that there are multiple determining factors, and it's hard to tell all the ones that may be at play. All right, guys. Like and subscribe, share and share alike. Make sure people know that I'm not actually on full jihad against our crusade. I won't be culturally insensitive. Um, our struggle session against modern monetary the theorists. I just don't think without a more robust class theory and thus realizing its limitations because of that, that it's going to be as useful as people think. Um, uh, Mike Gumbine. I'll check Mike Gumbine out. I'm always trying to find better MMTers. Um, I'm also going to get some non MMTers on there, uh, too, because I think in general, broad spectrum heterodox economics needs to be discussed. Um, 
have I written it elsewhere? No. In fact, what I think labor theory of value is, is because I don't think value is price. I think value is an attractor to price and aggregate, which means that labor theory of value shows up in statistical aggregates. It won't show up, and it's kind of implied in Marx, but it's not worked out. Um, it won't show up in any individual price, but that's why profits would exist in the first place. And that explains the difference. That explains like why rent seeking, well, for example, real commodities trend down, rent seeking commodities don't. And the only reason I can explain it has to do with LVT and the difference between variable and um, variable capital. And when something has only variable capital and it can only be paid for at cost or better, it's going to constantly go up and you might even have cost disease problem. Whereas if something has commodity, you can, you can reduce the event through, through social development and the improvement of technology, you can actually reduce the, um, the constant capital, but you can only make profits by productivity increases, which is a nice way of saying labor value. All right. Um, and how that shows up in the economy is if you look at all prices in aggregate, the, the price will, will approach the value uh, and the profit margin will approach the cost of labor in the entire sector. All right. Um, that's my, that's my best explanation for it. Um, uh, the, the debates with, uh, post Keynesian such as Stinkeem have to do with whether or not you believe that constant capital adds value. And I kind of think some of this is a is a is an interpretation of what value is, um, because I think over time machines machines will eventually step step out at replacement cost, and as profits go down, the replacement cost stays the same. Whereas like labor is variable, you can exploit you know you can exploit more or less depending on all kinds of conditions. Um, which is, you know, social reproduction conditions, uh, purchasing power of, of the individual, of the individual people within like the, the workers themselves as consumers, et cetera, and so forth. So you can kind of mess with that. It's fungible in a way that eventually constant capital isn't. All right. Whew. That's a lot. I actually like micro and cheese. Um, I also would suggest money on the left. If you're going to get that, um, and again, I don't agree with all these people. I don't, but I think you should at least listen to them and understand them if you're going to be economically literate. It also suggest uh, reading uh, the debates on people who reject MMTR like breakdown theorists, because I think they have some good points. Um, I think Ted Reese does raise some things that that I, you know, I when I saw Ted Reese and Sam Kangaroo debate, I actually thought Sam won, but only because Ted just seemed to be blindsided by a lot of the the frameworks of MMT, just totally blindsided by them, um, and and didn't know how to handle the difference in what we meant, because we're not talking about the same things. All right. Because for me, profits aren't really, the profits being denominated in, in, in currency can be misleading because it's really about purchasing power. Okay, I am delusional. I'm going to go lay down before I appear on TIR tonight. Have a good night.